Do you know how hard it is to truly generate random numbers? I, I don't mean the random number generator on your phone or anything like this. That's just algorithm that crunches something, but it's deterministic. True random numbers are super difficult to generate. There is even a Wikipedia article about it. What you need to do is you need to measure some actual physical phenomenon like atmospheric noise or, or thermal noise or, or other things that we have no idea. They are so chaotic. We just can't predict them and thus their results are truly truly random random.org even sells true random number generators for you this is big topic humanity has searched far and wide for truly random processes but now ladies and gentlemen we found it the NeurIPS review process is a absolutely truly random phenomenon <laughs> So, if you're not aware, a way, way time ago in NeurIPS, what was that, 2014, the organizers made a little experiment where they gave a certain set of papers that was submitted to the conference, not only to one committee to review, but to two separate committees in order to track how the committees would agree or disagree. Now, the results right there were quite damning, to be honest. So, not only did they not find find any sort of correlation between what the reviewers scores they gave with any sort of future citations and that's a paper that I've covered in a video where they look back seven years later at whether or not the reviewers could predict anything about these papers turns out they cannot they also found that the reviewers mostly didn't really agree that much. So here were these experiments. Now of the 166 papers, most were rejected by both committees, which most papers to such a conference are rejected. So reject is sort of the default answer. But here, look at that. If committee one accepted and committee one accepted for 22 plus 21 papers, so for 33 papers, committee two only agreed on half of them. And likewise, when committee two accepted for the 43 papers, and this is 44 papers, so for the 44 papers that committee two accepted, committee one only agreed again in half of them. So this means that if you were to switch committees for the papers, only half of the accepted papers would be the same papers. Half of them would be other papers that had actually been rejected by the other committee, which is kind of crazy, but this just shows you how noisy this process really is. Now it's 2021 and we've actually repeated this experiment. So here's a Reddit post by the user Waiguo Chiang that has scraped from open review these scores and put together some statistics such as this one here that shows the average rating of the papers versus how many of papers were in a particular bucket and what ultimately happened to them. So we only have full data insight into the accepted papers and the rejected papers that have sort of voluntarily agreed to make their reviews public, which most papers that are rejected don't. Now the most interesting part here is this one. This is the repetition of the NeurIPS experiment. You can see at the bottom the total is almost 300 papers. And again, these are not all the papers part of the experiment. These are only the papers that were accepted because we don't know anything about the other ones. So the way this worked was the follows. Papers were given to two separate committees. These two committees reached a decision independently of each other. And then the maximum of the two decisions was taken as an acceptance criterion. So if either of the committees accepted the paper to be published, the paper was going to be published. So to understand this table, the leftmost column is the final decision, which is the max of decision one and decision two. Not always, but we'll get to that. Then the second column is the decision of the first committee. And the third column is the decision of the second committee. Now these things are ordered. So it's not the same as in the last paper I've shown you. So since there's no clear ordering, we simply always put the larger decision on the left and the second large decision on the right. So the most interesting part of this is how many papers were accepted by one committee but rejected by another one. For that, we have to add together all the rows where one of the decision is a reject. So 174, 
24 plus 16 plus 9 is, I think, 199 papers. 199 papers out of the 298 papers that were accepted had actually been rejected by a second committee. So to compare, we have to do the following. We'll say that essentially the analogy would be that 22 and 22 and 21 papers, so 65 papers would be our analogous total number from down here. Those are the papers that ultimately ended up being accepted because they were accepted by one of the committees. And then 22 plus 21 papers, so 43 papers, would be the amount of papers that would have been rejected by one of the two committees, but ultimately ended up being accepted because it was accepted by the other one. So according to this, here we see 43 out of 65 papers only were accepted by one of the committees. And here we see that roughly 200 out of 300 papers were only accepted by one of the committees. In both cases, it's about two thirds of the paper, which means that actually this is remarkably consistent. So in the face of that, and with the explosion of the machine learning community, more papers, more reviewers, and so on, you could actually say it's a, a good thing. It's actually surprising this hasn't gotten much worse over the years. Now that's one way to look at it. And the other way to look at it is to say this is crap. Like, come on, this is completely inconsistent. Not only the accept reject is inconsistent, you see, of the six papers suggested to an oral by one of the committees, this was never confirmed by another committee. And how many were suggested for a spotlight by one of the committees? 16, 20, 29, 41, 44. 44 papers were suggested for a spotlight by one of the committees, yet only three had actually both committees agreeing. And again, the same results hold. If you were to swap out committees, if you just differently assign people to papers, half of the papers that are in the conference would be different. Half. And I don't know how people can still claim that peer review is like this esteemed thing that is supposed to catch errors and do quality control and yada, yada, yada. There's something to be said that if you have a really good paper, the probability that a different committee also accepts it is, is pretty high. And also, if you have a really bad paper, the probability that two committees agree on rejecting it, I guess that's even higher. However, most papers fall somewhere in the middle, and that's the area of true randomness. Essentially, what you do is you throw your paper in there and then something, something happens and then you get a random number at the end. And remember, people use this to justify archive blackouts, social media blackouts. Oh my God, you cannot bias the reviewers. You must not bias the pristine review. Like how? You're, you cannot bias a random number generator. I guess you can, but it makes no makes no sense. Like honestly, this is only half joking at this point. The social media networks that we have, people surfacing interesting papers from the depths of, of archive and from their social networks, all the people filtering this kind of stuff. Yes, there's promotion going on. Yes, there's hype. Yes, money plays a role. But still, this is a much better process than just like three random dudes sitting on the toilet, like scrolling through your paper a bit and then writing, uh, not enough experiments, uh, reject. I don't understand it. It's confusing. Look at the learning rate grafting video I did. Like these are the types of reviews that reviewers have to battle with. Yes, it hasn't gotten much worse over the years. Yes, really good papers are consistent, really bad papers are consistent. But I still maintain that this situation is not really a good one. This is absolutely inconsistent. It's a lottery. Your best bet is to write as many papers as you can that are just barely, barely not crap and then throw all of them in. And through the random number process, some of them will get accepted. And that's a sad state because big companies do this for clout. Big companies do it to recruit new people and so on. But there are a lot of PhD students that need to get whatever their three papers published in their four or five years that they're doing the PhD. And with such randomness and with only very, very limited amount of conferences that you can submit to over the course of a year, there's like three or four different big conferences that you realistically can submit to if you want a good impact factor. This is very bad situation and a lot of people are going to be damaged just because the universe has some random fluctuations. The solution to this honestly starts with 
professors, tenured professors, start handing out PhDs independent of conference submissions. Universities start giving professors tenure not on the basis of the impact factor of where they publish. Look at citations, look at how popular the work is in any other metric. Stop considering impact factors of conferences. Grant agencies stop giving out grants based on the reputations of the professors based on the impact factors. Essentially disregard conference publications for anything you do. I see some people, they have to do it. Some professors have to get tenure and this is a criterion. PhD students have to do this because that's a requirement for their PhD. But if you're in a position to discard all of this, do it. What stops you? You have tenure. Tell your PhD students, do three really nice, really good archive publications. If I'm happy with it, PhD. All right, that was it from me for ranting about this topic. What do you think about it? Let me know in the comments. Maybe I'm completely wrong here, but you know, I'm happy to be educated to the contrary. See ya.